Welcome to Books and Arts this Saturday afternoon. We're coming to you live from the opening weekend of the Asia Pacific Triennial of Contemporary Art, APT8, at the Gallery of Modern Art in Brisbane. APT is the world's largest exhibition of art from Australia, Asia and the Pacific, and one of the most anticipated and influential events on the contemporary art calendar. So it's fantastic that you can join us on your radio, mobile phone, podcasting platform or right here in person in the very comfortably air-conditioned surrounds of Goma's Cinema A. I'm Sarah Konoski. I hope you can stay with me for an hour of conversation with artists and curators and some live music from a very special guest. This is Books and Arts on RN, live from APT8. And we're going to be beginning this afternoon with some of the brains of the art world, the curators who make the decisions about what art we see and who help set the agenda for the sort of art that gets made. Maud Page is Deputy Director of Collections and Exhibitions at the Queensland Art Gallery and Gallery of Modern Art. Emmanuel Casareru is Chief Curator of the French Overseas Territories at the Musée de Quai Branly in Paris. And Yasson Bernal is Co-Curator of the Filipino Cinema Project that's happening as part of this APT8. Welcome all of you to Books and Arts. Thank you. Maud, congratulations. Give us a sense of the scale of this APT. How many artists are on show? There's actually, good morning, there's actually 83 different artists and they're across our two buildings, so both at Quag and at Goma and in every single gallery space in Goma. So it is really a huge event for us. And 83 artists, are they shown together by country or how are they grouped together? Well, not necessarily. This time we've really gone out into the region to think about the idea of performance and the body and figuration so that we have travelled to specific countries, obviously, but really it's not about trying to pick an artist from a certain country. It's more that we have wanted to explore those thematics and really to look at what is the newest and most exciting thing in contemporary art at this very moment what speaks to our sense of being, our sense of who we are, what's happening, what we're doing. And so what themes have come out for you looking at artists working in this region? Well, we have, we have, as I said, been looking at performance and that's been quite interesting for us because obviously when we first started in 1993, we're a 22-year project. So the wonderful thing about us is that we really build that knowledge up and we can build on conversations, we can return back to conversations, leave things be and then come back when the time is ripe. So that performance has been crucial because it's such a part of the Pacific, for example, but also Asia and Australia. So this time, because the rest of the world is so concerned with performance, we've thought, well, we've got a little bit to say here, having had this 22 years of, of experience. So it's been that accumulation and then really looking at, well, what's new? What, is, what are artists saying that is totally different to what you might find in the rest of the world? People might be surprised by the range of countries included. Asia Pacific can, can conjure up a fairly narrow range, but there are artists here from Turkey, from Mongolia. Yes, that's right. I think also that's the other thing. I mean, we don't work with that set countries in terms of the barriers. We really try and look through how those ideas are threaded through. So the idea of West Asia came through quite a while ago in the APT, and that is including, as you're saying, countries like Turkey, but we've gone to the Kyrgyz Republic this time, to Georgia. We're really looking at those connections. What, what is elsewhere that can teach us a little bit about how we see the world from our position here in Australia? It's really important to kind of turn that around. It's too often that we see the world from those big centres in Europe and in the United States. Emmanuel Casareru, you're based in Paris now, but you were involved early on in APT. When did you first work with APT? I think I was first introduced to the APT by Susan Cochran, who used to be uh, on the panel also for the second APT. I was also on the panel of selection for Middle Asia and Oceania. And uh, at that time, it was very interesting, but I, w I was based in New Caledonia, and we were developing a new cultural centre, which is called the the Chibao Cultural Center, which opened in 98, in 98 yes. And there was a very interesting uh, dynamism in the, these two uh, parts of the Pacific, not so far away. 
And it was a very um, interesting challenge also for us trying to be uh, um, challenging <laughs> uh, what, hap what was happening at the time in, in Brisbane and at the same time in Noumea. And was it for you a new way to showcase, say, the art from your own part of the Asia-Pacific New Caledonia? This APT was very important for us because it uh, didn't only connect uh, Oceania, the Pacific Island, within, with Australia and New Zealand, but also reconnect the old region with Asia, which we know it's a very uh, old uh, historical, archaeological uh, of, and uh, cultural importance, of course. So I, I guess that was uh, what's the main uh, um, uh, lesson, uh, the, the main uh, um, uh, thing I learned from that time, from the coming to the APT. And tell me about the institution that you're with now, the Musée de Quai Branly. What's the collection there? The uh, Musée du, du Quai Branly is a museum which uh, opened about 10 years ago. And it's a, it's a new museum, but very old collection. It's a, it's a combination of very uh, two old collections from, uh, from France, dating from the uh, early uh, 17th century until now. And it's a collection regarding uh, all the four continents of the world except Europe. So it's quite a, a, a big collection, but also historical collection, which sometimes uh, uh, gives, uh, uh, gives us more focus on the past and may, uh, probably not enough focus on what is going on and what will be what is contemporary art today. Does it show contemporary art? Uh, a bit of. Uh, some, but uh, always, uh, I may say, uh, related with uh, rituals or uh, a kind of uh, uh, continuity between the old collection and the new aspect of reinvention of culture in the different part of the world, we can document with our collection. And I think there's different ways of looking at some of these art traditions, whether they're seen in the, through the lens of the, the museum of anthropology or through art theory and the gallery is something that's significant and will return to. But I want to bring in Yason Bernal, who's co-curator of Filipino Indie, which is one of the film programs happening as part of this APT. What sort of works are going to be on show in that? Um, yeah, it's quite an ex uh, expansive program. We have around 30 feature films. Um, so tracing back from the sort of the emergence of independent cinema, but also um, having some certain signposts like early uh, uh, 80s and 90s uh, cinema, and then we've also included a short film program focusing on uh, experimental short film makers, uh, the ones who did like worked on Super 8 and uh, artist video, another program on that, and another on activist videos. We've also supplied uh, YouTube hyperlinks to kind of uh, contextualize the notion of social realism in kind of contemporary culture. So why, Jason, were the Philippines chosen out of all the countries in this region to have a film project? Why were you the lucky, um, the lucky nation to be represented in film? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm you glad. must have had an I answer. Mean, I'm, glad. I'm glad. Um, I think it's, um, I mean, just for the region, I think it's great what's happening. And um, not just with cinema, but visual arts, we don't really have much support from the government at all. So. It's, uh, it's always been DIY, you know. So I think it's a bonus when, you, you, when these works get seen. But the Philippines has a very old film industry. Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, it was one of the most vibrant, if not uh, in terms of the market back in the 50s. Uh, and then with the martial law uh, regime of Marcos, uh, there was the so-called second golden age of cinema. So, uh, but there was a decline in the 90s and I don't think it's just the Philippines because of just the, the cost of film production and the advent of digital technology. So there's this so-called new wave, uh, people who are working in digital and uh, also entering the visual arts sphere, like installation and museum, uh, films being shown in a museum context, yeah. This is Books and Arts on RN, coming to you live from the opening weekend of APT8, the Asia-Pacific Triennial of Contemporary Art at Brisbane's Gallery of Modern Art and Queensland Art Gallery. We'll be hearing live music from Christian Thompson and meeting some artists who are showing work in this APT8 later. But right now I'm speaking with curatorial brains, Maud Page from Quag Goma, Emmanuel Casareru from the Musée du Quai Branly in Paris, and Yasson Bernal, co-curator of the Filipino Cinema Project that's part of this APT. 
Maud, if we look back a little at the history of APT, because as, as you're saying, it's been going now for over two decades, how unique was it at its inception? How different was it from the ways that art from this region was being looked at and talked about? Well, I think that when it originally started, art from the region wasn't looked at, and that was the why it was seen so, or received so well, because I think there were specific exhibitions, say, on Japan or, or China, but really they happened very sporadically. And the APT was a, a platform that suddenly was able to show a whole lot of countries together and a whole lot of artists together. So that's why it was important. So it was really, I think, uh, quite a brainwave at the time when everyone was still looking towards Europe that we looked towards the region. What was important as well is that we were a very new gallery, so we didn't have the really expansive collections of some of our other state galleries. So we really had to look towards, well, what identity can we form? And that's what's been wonderful, is that from that very beginning, now we've formed an incredible vision that is so solely based on that art from Asia and the Pacific, and it gives us that distinctiveness, which is great, because it's built on that long history. I wonder, though, I mean, as you're saying, there's such a range of countries represented, 32 countries, you know, from Mongolia to Pakistan to South Korea to PNG. Given that spread, is it meaningful, or how is it meaningful, I suppose, to look at these works together? Emmanuel, I wonder what you think about using this category to look at such different sorts of work in the one exhibition? I think it gives you a wider vision of what is uh, creativity in the region. And also, it gives a, a strong uh, confrontation sometimes. And uh, I think it will raise for each uh, artist a kind of self-confidence also for, for himself or for herself by looking at others because sometimes when you, you, you live in the region in small islands, small villages, you have something to say, you, 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 you're a bit shy, you don't know if you are allowed to. And when you come to this kind of uh, uh, big platform, you see other people in the same, the same situation. And I think this is probably one of the main uh, importance of the APT in the region, specifically, specifically for the Pacific Island. Yes, and what about from the perspective of film? I mean, is it... Um, differently valid to look at Filipino film in the context of film from Indonesia, film from Australia, than against American film or European mm. cinema? Well, um, well the Filip I mean, Philippine cinema, or at least the Philippine film industry, is, has been strongly influenced by Hollywood because we were colonized um, by America. Um, that said, I think um, traces of, you know, at least uh, encounters with post colonial cinema or um, even the region. I think at the end of the day, um, while there are overlaps, uh, it's still be interesting to, to look at artist practices. Um, and so there might be have overlapping influences, but for example, like filmmakers like Lav Diaz does like really, you know, like durational films uh, or punk filmmakers like Cam de la Cruz may have reacted to a certain Hollywood formula or aesthetic, uh, but also at the same time, um, kind of being really embedded in a uh, sense of the local, I guess. And Lab Diaz is a Filipino filmmaker yes. who yeah. is a real focus of uh, the program yes. that you've yeah. put together. Yeah. And he makes very long, like 12 yes. hours. Yes, 12 hours. Um, his short film is four. So it makes hours. the Titanic <laughs> look like a, like a short. When yeah, it's yeah. Something but he's good, like yeah. I mean, it's interesting, again, the, the notion of the long take uh, in European cinema or has been used a lot, and Warhol also used the long take, but it's also different how he uses that. So it's more of the technique that gets, I guess, translated in different uh, ways. Based on How's the audience understood in a film of that length? Uh, are people meant to come and go, or is there a commitment to the, the whole work when you sit down? Um, I think that's when uh, the visual and the kind of the cinematic space uh, gets really interesting because uh, I guess like with any film when you're in a movie theater there's this um, I guess criteria that you have to sit through but that's why it's exciting I think for his films to be shown in a in a visual art context and uh, so that people can see cinema in a more sculptural aspect more conceptual uh, so that's an interesting context for for film to be seen also. 
More page, the planning that goes into APT is mind-boggling to me. Does it fi- feel a relief to finally reach the opening weekend? Absolutely and <laughs> totally. <laughs> I'm glad you can't see my face. <laughs> There's a certain no. certain weight in your voice that's There's communicated. A, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big, big thing. But the incredible thing is that it's a well-oiled machine, I would say. By now, we, we really, it's every three years, we know what to expect. We know we've got to fill the two buildings. There's always things that we haven't done. So like bringing in Asim Wakif, that 57 metre sprawling timber installations with members that are 1.3 tonnes of wood. That is kind of, it's always logistically really difficult, but there's people here on staff that actually love those challenges. So give us a challenge. You want to build a bridge over the water mall and have water coming down shore. There's people here that can actually, which is what's amazing, is to see all of these. It's the architects, the designers, the curators, the people that work on the floor. Everyone gets together and nuts things out until we can deliver them. So what's the process of finding the artists? How do you actually select the work that's included in APT? Well, what we begin by a lot of research. So a lot of research is done with people's different areas of interest and uh, specialty, and then we actually travel. So we're really fortunate with the Australia Council to be able to get out into the region and do that real Leg work. So, so we, where did you did you yourself I, go out yes, this time? Yes, I did actually. I went to India, which was absolutely mind-boggling, fantastic. And tell me a bit about the work, the artists that you found there on that trip. Well, I was very keen to look at the idea of indigeneity, how it occurs in other countries. So for me, it was I think that in Australia we really have a lot to say and about indigeneity, about how we include contemporary artists into. Um, the whole idea of indigeneity, how artists that are working in traditional practices can actually be included in that mix. So working with Indian rural artists, so there's about 200 different styles of rural artists in, uh, in India, we were able to select 19 and we've created an incredible collection of absolutely beautiful, beautiful works that talk to the contemporary but come from very, very customary and old practices. This is the art project Kalpa Vriksha. Kalpa Vriksha, that's right, that's in Quag. Emmanuel, the debate around uh, where traditional art or vernacular art sits in the contemporary art context, I think has, you know, it's evolved over time, over the, certainly over the 20 or so years of the APT. From your perspective, where is it now? I mean, is, is art that comes out of specific traditions in this region fully accepted within a contemporary art context? I think it depends on uh, one, one, the side of the, of the world you, you are looking at. Uh, because I switch, I, I was looking at it, at it from the southern hemisphere, and I was very close to the kind of thing we are doing in New Zealand and Australia. Being now in, in Europe, I, I guess it's a bit different. You have to cope also with an old uh, history, a vision, a kind of relationship with what is art and what is not art, which is a bit different. <clears throat> and But uh, thanks to the kind of uh, event was, were developed here, especially the APT, I think, we, we still follow the APT from Paris. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's very important, yeah. We, we all always keep an eye on <clears throat> because it, uh, it helps also this kind of institution I work in now to, to see the things a bit differently that they used to do. Say from contemporary artists working in your part of the world, New Caledonia or other parts of the Pacific, is it significant whether their work is shown in a gallery like Quagoma or a museum? What's the, what's the significance for those artists? I think it depends on the kind of uh, context uh, you, you present the, the, the art. So it can be very different uh, according to the different uh, exhibition. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's uh, probably uh, a, a kind of... Uh, 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 a, a, cha- a new challenge to be seen outside a museum in a kind of context like a, a, a gallery, a, a Calabria art gallery, because it's open also the, the way you look at yourself, not only as uh, the voice, a representative of one specific uh, part of the population, and you open, you, you open your mind, you open also maybe your, the, the, the way you address your own identity and the, the relationship you, you will have uh, with the rest of the world. 
There's a dance project from Melanesia that's an important part of this APT more. Tell me a bit about that. That's called Yumi Danis and it is an important project for us because we really wanted to begin a project in the Pacific itself. So not just pluck art and bring it and show it on our walls or perform it, but we really wanted to begin something elsewhere and then see how that develops. So we brought out different artists from New Caledonia, PNG, Solomon Islands and Fiji and they had a, a camp in Ambrum in Vanuatu and developed the idea of, well, what does performance mean for Melanesia? How, how can we also communicate that to a non-Melanesian audience? And they've created one of the most, I think, amazing installations in, in this APT. So it's upstairs in Goma and you enter it, you have to bend down in order to enter, so it's kind of a reverential kind of physical action to get into the room. Then all around you are all of these beautiful projections and you're almost like in a forest that begins to become alive with people that emerge out of the forest. And alongside it is a little kind of hut and within it are those people that performed at Ambrum. So it's a real act of generosity as to a sharing of culture, but also brought in in such a contemporary way. I mean, I find that project absolutely spectacular. And I guess when we're talking about the, the relationship between contemporary and tradition, uh, Performance, which as you've said, Maud, is a focus of this APT, is a very interesting lens to look at that because sometimes we can think that, you know, performance art was invented in a New York loft in 1963. But say, Emmanuel, from your, from your home, there is phenomenal traditions of performance. Yes, that's right. And so sometimes we look at cultural heritage much more with an ent in a focus on intangible aspect of cultural heritage than tangible aspect. This is sometimes the tension between museums and local population because uh, in Europe they were focusing much more on, on, the, t on the objects and, uh, and the object has just produced for one occasion and then dis discarded the, the importance and the permanence in uh, many tradition is uh, know-how to make the object and not the object by itself. Mm -hmm. I think that's, sorry, if I can interrupt, that's a really important part of this APT. And Asim Wakif with his wooden structure also talked about that, that he said, look, there's a tendency to fetishize the, the object itself, but we're losing, we're losing the thread of how that object was created, that cultural knowledge, and it's really important to pay equal attention to that. And those intangible, moments that that you're describing Emmanuel are really they're key but how do you present them in a museum context very difficult to well of course yes on one way to present these intangible experiences of performances in film and given the focus on performance in this APT how do you see that uh, that emphasis and that move I guess in contemporary art in terms of the tradition of film oh um, well uh, Philippines also has a very uh, like vibrant, both traditional and contemporary performance scene. And I think in terms of cinema, again, going to Lau's uh, work, it's very performative in that sense that um, the notion of narrative is, uh, you know, charges the audience because of its length. You don't just watch a film, you, you live time, you know, you, you're actually performing as well. Um, uh, filmmakers like Roxley, uh, who's uh, a very important pioneering punk filmmaker who did performances and gets filmed in Super 8. Kidlat Tahimik, who is the father of independent cinema, creates video diaries that uh, document both his life and also his vision. So I think it's quite interesting like how cinema uh, does create a performative uh, aspect to, to art making. There's always a real buzz around the gallery on the opening weekend of APT, and um, I don't think it's just because of the champagne that happens at the <laughs> APT opening party, but that has to be an, an aspect of it. Tell me more about the um, Indonesian artist Melati Suryodamo, who's working on a, on a performance just above us, on the floor mm. above us in mm. the cinema. Mm. Well, it's wonderful that you mentioned that because in terms of that, uh, how we might perceive performance differently, that's, you could almost see that as durational performance, which is such a tradition in Western art history or Western art performance history. And Melati has taken it to another level. So she started at 8, she will finish at 8pm tonight and she is grinding charcoal all day in a white 
dress and she picks up the charcoal and just methodically just grinds and grinds and it's really about the passing of time it talks about the charcoal was once a tree it's been grinded back into something that is intangible again so very very beautiful so she has this one 12 hour performance yes. and then the room is left for the duration of the rest that's of the right. apt that's right her dress will be left there and we will also have a documentation of that performance but it's extremely moving i just went up and had a look before it's extremely moving to watch her and quite meditative i saw as well a yes. group of people transfixed yes. as watching yes her. absolutely absolutely it's just it's beautiful i, I can't pretend that it didn't call to mind the experience of looking after small children. I think there should be videos of parents around the world just spending 12 hours doing repetitive tasks. I'm sure and, there is know. already. <laughs> this is Books and Arts on RN. We're coming to you live from the opening weekend of APT8, the Asia Pacific Triennial at Brisbane's Gallery of Modern Art and the Queensland Art Gallery. And I'd like you to join me in thanking our curatorial brains. Maud Page, Deputy Director of Collections and Exhibitions at the Queensland Art Gallery and Gallery of Modern Art. Emmanuel Cassaret, Chief Curator of the French Overseas Territories at the Musée de Quai Branly in Paris, and Yasson Bernal, who's co-curator of the Filipino Cinema Project happening as part of this APT. <laughs> now, because we've all been talking about performance, and Maud's been so clearly explaining that performance is a central part of this APT, I think we better experience some, and we're very lucky to have that in the person of Christian Thompson, an artist of Bijara heritage who works in video, photography, sculpture, performance, and sound. Welcome to Books and Arts, Christian. Thank you. Can you tell me what you're going to be performing for us? Uh, yeah, this first track is um, a song from uh, a video work that I actually produced during the um, Marina Abramovich Kaldor Arts Residency called Dead Tongue. Mayara Kandu Mambu Muna 
And arts on RN. We're coming to you live from the opening weekend of APT8 and being treated to a performance by one of the artists of this APT, Christian Thompson, who is um, performing music as part of this APT and also has some photographic work that he'll tell us about. But we're going to hear another song, I believe, Christian. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Christian Thompson, outrageously talented person. I've admired your photography and now it turns out you're a really beautiful singer as well. <laughs> it's like you just got all the genetic luck, Christian. 
Christian's an artist of Bijara heritage who features in this APT. I'm Sarah Konoski and I'm bringing you RN's Books and Arts Live from the opening weekend of APT8. It's great to have your company, whether you're joining us over the airwaves or here in Cinema A at Brisbane's GOMA. And as Christian joins us for the panel on artists, let me introduce you to our other two guests. We have Ming Wong, who was born in Singapore, but now lives and works in Berlin. Ming was trained in Chinese painting and has been a playwright, another outrageously genetically gifted person. He now makes witty, provocative works, which I can attest to having seen them upstairs, playing with cinema and popular culture. And they've been shown recently in Berlin, Rotterdam, Jakarta and Sydney. We also have Lisa Rehana, who's a Maori artist of Ngāpui descent, whose multidisciplinary works have brought her audiences around the world as well. Lisa's work has featured in APT2 and APT4, and for this APT, Lisa is part of the opening weekend conference. And Christian joins us. Please make all of our artists welcome. <laughs> Christian, I want to start with you, having just heard those two beautiful pieces. What language are you singing in? Uh, it's Bidra, yeah. And is that a language that you grew up speaking, or how did you uh, come to write? Yeah, it was my, uh, my father's language. We sort of grew up speaking a kind of um, pidgin Bidra, but the songs that I've written are sort of a combination of um, oral, um, learnt language, and also um, learnt from texts, historical texts as well. And how long have you been singing for as part of your art practice? Um, well, I've been in bands for years, but, but probably since 2007 I've been writing my own music, yeah. And how do you see it in relation to the other visual art that you make? Is it, is it a continuum or are they different sorts of practices? Um, I guess my work is, um, is sort of inherently performative. So I'm always just trying to find the right medium to best express the idea behind the work. So um, in some works, there's sort of immersive soundscapes. In others, there's sort of more traditional kind of pop sort of tracks like these ones or um, uh, spoken words. So, yeah. And tell us a little bit about the content of those two songs. Um, the first song is basically a sort of, um, it sort of accompanies a video work where I'm sort of holding two um, Union Jack flags in my mouth and they're sort of waving in the wind and that song is playing in the background but basically I try to write songs around different kinds of rituals so um, the first song was about a sort of young couple that sort of stumble upon a ceremony that they weren't meant to see and Guru Bogobadja actually translates to um, you know come back here come back here so um, and then the second song Jagan Yilongu actually translates to brother so um, it's about kinship and camaraderie and connectedness, I guess. And uh, was Bijara a language that you grew up speaking, or has it been a part of um, part of the process of this work is is adapting the language in new ways or researching the language? Yeah, well, we grew up speaking a kind of, yeah, a pidgin version of Bijara. So, yeah, we sort of use words for, it's, a com it's mixed in with English. So, um, yeah, but, you know, years ago, I asked my father if we actually had any songs left, and he said no, and I just thought, well, i just start writing my own, so I did. Which part of Australia is Bidjara spoken? Uh, it's actually Springshaw, Carnarvon Gorge, yeah. So, Charleville, Springshaw, Carnarvon Gorge, between there, that's Bidjara sort of country, yeah. Ming, tell me about the work that you've got in this APT. All right, the work is called Aku Akan Betahan, or I Will Survive, and um, it's inspired by the history of Australian cinema. I wanted to see what I could do as a, as a Singaporean artist of Chinese descent, making a work for the Asia Pacific Triennial. And I thought one point of commonality is our neighbor Indonesia. So I traveled to uh, Yogyakarta and I decided to um, do these interpretations of Australian cinema, but transposed to the the landscape of, uh, of, of Yogyakarta. And the three films in question are Picnic at Hanging Rock, and Walkabout, and Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. I mean, I watched a lot of Australian cinema as part of the research, but these films came to the fore uh, when I was um, traveling around, uh, around Yogyakarta, and I was really inspired by the kind of uh, mythical uh, landscapes. And these films really are about the struggle between uh, man and nature. 
And I think this is something very much in my mind when I was uh, doing my research. So in the artworks, it's you feature in them, am I right? And three other men. Are they from Indonesia or are they, where are those performers? Well, this, for this work, I roped in uh, f uh, three other collaborators. So there's me from Singapore. There's Tamara Petamina, who's an artist from Yogyakarta. There's uh, Shaman Suku, who's a, a friend uh, from Singapore originally, but now based in Sydney. And then there's Brad Edwards, uh, a friend of Shaman's from Sydney. So we form a colorful quartet of performers. And what we did is we had a two-week uh, workshop uh, in Georgia where we um, uh, film these sequences um, in the landscapes. We also did a dance rehearsal with, uh, with a choreographer, O'Neill Tasman, who taught us a mixture of um, classical Javanese dance, uh, a bit of dangdut, which is Indonesian popular music, and contemporary hip hop, a bit like Beyonce. And the music that we used was uh, I Will Survive, the anthem by Gloria Gaynor, but uh, reinterpreted by uh, a street band that we found in, in, in Yogyakarta. They are an Anklung band. They, they play with these uh, bamboo instruments. And they made a very beautiful kind of uh, um, translation of the song. And what are you wearing on your heads, Ming? Well, the, the, when you look at it, Sometimes it looks it, it looks familiar. It, 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 the references of, to Australian cinema are there, but uh, on the other hand, there are references to um, Indonesian kind of like uh, styling. Uh, I made four wigs for the four of us. They're made of um, recycled raffia string it's in primary colors. They're actually the colors of uh, plastic bags. Um, so they're, they're neon, they're phenomenally bright. They're phenomenally bright. And when we put them on, it, it, and the pictures look like uh, something out of a children's uh, storybook. Yeah. A disturbing children's storybook. In fact. <laughs> I think the one that I, that I really loved is the picnic at Hanging Rock because it's those iconic images of, of the white dresses and the, um, the rock and the trees, and then there's the four of you wandering through with these mad uh, sort of ginger meg wigs on. Yeah, they're very interesting. They're very interesting works. Yeah. <laughs> Lisa Rehana, your um, your work in pursuit of Venus infected is on show at the moment over at um, the Queensland Art Gallery. Tell me about that work, please. It's a, a, a really large work that was inspired by seeing um, a French scenic wallpaper, Les Sauvages de la Mer Pacifique. I saw it at the National Gallery of Australia um, about eight or so years ago. And the thing that struck me was how it purported to represent peoples from the Pacific, peoples from here in Australia and also in Nootka Sound. And uh, when I was looking at these kind of glorious um, imagery, it had nothing to do with the people that I knew at home. And uh, a number of years later, I was casting about for an idea for a, a video project and remembered, recalled seeing the, the wallpaper and then thinking about notions of video wallpaper and, and kind of utopian ideas of landscapes and how we you know, have these ideas of landscapes in our mind's eye and, and then how we populate those places. And the thing that happened in New Zealand a number of years ago, there was a lot of uh, contestation about, about the foreshore, we call it the, um, the foreshore debate about who owned you know, that, that kind of um, intertidal zone, the space in between sort of land and sea. And in a way, the wallpaper is situated. Um, it, it shows that there's a horizon line and it's the place of encounter. It's, it's how people meet each other. It's um, because of the sea that we, that human beings have moved around the earth, apart from walking, but um, in order to, to go to other spaces, it's been um, by vessels, by boat. Um, and certainly uh, the work was, um, inspired by the images that were recorded on Captain Cook's journey. I mean, he was incredibly, he became so famous because he had artists on board. And for me, that was really interesting as an artist of today. 
And thinking about um, how these images became recorded, um, and then they became like Chinese whispers, and then versions and versions and versions of um, what Pacific people look like, until they became neoclassical. So um, I've recreated that background image as a CGI image, and then used um, green screen technology to to put real people there, friends, family, friends of friends. Friends of enemies, enemies <laughs> of friends, um, uh, just to yeah, to 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 kind of contest that idea. And what was you thinking about it? Because again, we've got this performance element coming through with your work, Lisa. In terms of the, there's a series of. Uh, small vignettes that are happening, sort of like little uh, films within this wallpaper where performers are involved in one another, there's certain rituals happening. What was your decision making? What were you doing with those different vignettes? How were you deciding what to show in those performances? Well, it was a, a wonderful project to to research for because, I mean, I went back to a lot of um, anthropology anthropological versions of history and then talk to a whole lot of people about what their versions of those versions of history are. But just something that Yasin said uh, previously, there's nothing like duration and time and sitting through something and, and seeing, seeing um, from script, when you script something and then it comes to life, it's kind of an incredible moment. And even for me, when I'm trying to uh, reconsider the things that I read about, have been written about us, and I go, wow, I wonder what that looks like. And just to actually stage it, to reenact something so that you can watch it, brings you a, to a different understanding. And I think that's something that artists can do, or filmmakers, or, you know, it's a very, very different process reading something off a page. It might just be one sentence and seem very strange, but then to actually make the costumes, create the conditions to get it, and just to try and struggle why why did this thing happen, um, is a marvellous um, thing to behold. Christian, your photographic work that features in this APT comes out of the work that you've done with historical archives with the Pitt Rivers Museum at Oxford. Tell mm -hmm. me about that. Yeah, well, I mean, that body of work really sort of came out of um, my doctoral research. Um, I was looking at the Australian photographic collection of the Pitt Rivers Museum, and I produced a, series, a body of work called We Bury Our Own, which was my sort of the touchstone of my doctoral um, research. And then the Polari series came out of that. I moved to London, and then a lot of the sort of um, ceremonial kind of aspects then sort of filtered through the kind of, um, you know, um, urban landscape of London, and that, that series kind of um, came about. And this is the, the photos that are included in this um, APT. You're in white body paint and this sort of flowers in your head and smoke coming out of your mouth. They're very eerie images. Yeah, I mean, I was interested in these, um, I was interested in sort of pushing something that was more sort of theatrical in the work, but also something that was kind of reminiscent of sort of traditional kind of ceremonial practices, but brought very much into a sort of contemporary context. So it's really up to the audience in terms of how they, you know, what kind of um, history they sort of imbue those, those characters with. I wonder, given that I was speaking with the curators earlier this hour about the category of Asia-Pacific and what the benefit is of seeing works in this context, I'd be interested in your perspective as artists, whether you think of yourself as artists of the Asia-Pacific. Ming? Well, all my life as, a, as an artist, I've always had to play different cards, you know. It's, 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 it's coming from uh, being born and growing up in Singapore and then uh, being an artist in the UK and then in Berlin. Uh, you know, you find yourself trying to fit in sometimes with other people's uh, kind of like um, uh, categories. But this is an active kind of uh, strategy that I use now that it's, it's really beyond this and it's really um, trying to push for the fact that you, we all are individuals and it's, it's, it's really about sharing. And coming to, to, to APT, it's, it's, it's really great to kind of see um, some of the works are so resonant with me. It's, this is kind of almost like a homecoming show that I've come back to uh, this part of the world to, to do an exhibition. Do you think, Lisa, that your work has different um, resonances being shown in this context than, say, in a gallery in New York or in London? 
Certainly, because of the, the, the um, I mean, I think APT is a phenomenal, it's a phenomenon, it's amazing uh, the artists that are drawn together and the variety of work that you see here. I mean, uh, we have a very ancient um, line that connects us to Asia and that's the Austronesian co connection. And so that is also about the waka, waka um, practices. But for me, I, I, it's really important, the first place I ever, um, came internationally was to Australia and I have this theory that Australia and New Zealand or Aotearoa which is the Maori name is it's really important that's like a big brother little sister kind of it's the oldest um, culture in the world next to the youngest and so we have very much to learn from each other and to share and it is that sense of community and sharing um, so uh, I for the artists that are here, and, and, and as Emmanuel said before, coming from some of the islands, smaller islands, it's really an amazing opportunity to share and learn and just to have um, that leg up in a way and just to be in amidst um, so many artists because the artists are here and those relationships grow through time and that gives that, that opportunity. Yeah, there is a whole sort of infrastructure and institutional aspect to what happens perhaps behind the scenes for... Uh, at APT, which has resonances in this region and beyond. I wonder though, we have talked a lot about the pluses of the APT over its eight incarnations. I wonder from the point of view of these three artists, if there's something about APT, uh, there's something about this region that APT misses, is there something it could do better? Christian. <laughs> We're the worst person to go. I've been in Europe for 10 years. So I know. <laughs> well, what about from a European perspective? Is this, is this on the radar in Europe, what happens here with APT? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I think it's always, yeah, it definitely is actually, because um, a lot of the people that I sort of mix with in, um, in the UK of, you know, APT is internationally recognised. So, um, But I think last night there was an amazing energy and I thought a really celebratory energy about the show and I thought this is how you really, you know, enjoy the sort of artistic experience and maybe it's got something to do with the weather as well but it felt definitely that there was a real um, um, positive and celebratory feeling around the sort of interaction with the work and I think this particular APT is incredibly um, vibrant in that sense. Ming, maybe I should ask it in a more positive way. Where do you want APT to head from an artist's yeah. point of view? <laughs> Well, you know, one of the first questions I asked myself is why is APT located in Brisbane? It's, uh, and, I, and then I went to study the, kind of the history behind it, and it's, and it's great that it's here. But um, why, What do you mean? Why, why is it not in a bigger... Was that your first feeling? Why isn't it, say, in Sydney? Or? Well, you know, one of, the, one of the places that I went to for my research was Darwin, and I thought, like, APT should travel to Darwin, too. It's, you know, it's kind of geographically loaded, and it's... it's, it's, it's um, but um, all I'm saying is, it's APT has has potential to kind of travel, and it's, it's it has resonance every in, in every uh, in every place. Interesting. My my um, I could be wrong, but my perception is that APT did develop out of an artist -led, led project called ARCS, which um, was in Perth. Oh, well. Um, that I went to one in Perth, but it actually moved around. It went to different countries, and it was... Um, so they, they kind of picked up that model, but it, it became an institutional model, which is why it kind of um, lands here. I wouldn't want to say that there's anything missing, particularly I could cut my throat, and I don't want to do that publicly. <laughs> um, but what I think is really um, great to come here is what can we learn from APT and share back into, into other places and other regions. And one of the things I do love is the opening event because there is that sense that so many people get invited and it's a really great way to break down that elitism. The other thing that I think it does very well, or this gallery always has a great history of um, the children's programs and how you grow your next generation of art lovers and I'm, I really have to, you know, thank the everybody here at Quagoma because I think they do a great job and they, at all different levels. Well, that sounds like a very positive note to end on. I want you to join me in thanking our artists, Christian Thompson, Ming Wong and Lisa Rehana. And that brings us to the end of this very special live books and arts broadcast from the opening weekend of the 8th Asia Pacific Triennial of Contemporary Art in Brisbane. I want to thank all my guests. It's been a 
fantastic introduction to this exciting and important exhibition. Now I'm about to pass out, it's lucky we're at the end of the hour. And it's on until April, so there's plenty of time for you wherever you're listening to come and make a pilgrimage to see it. We've got all the details of our guests today and the events of this opening weekend at the Books and Arts page at RN Online, abc.net.au slash RN. Thanks to sound engineer Peter McMurray and to Jen Leak for production. A big thanks to all the staff at Quag Goma who've been so generous in having us here. I'm Sarah Konoski. I'll catch you next Saturday. <laughs>